Father, we thank you for uh, calling us out of ourselves and wanting to join together with the body of Christ. Thank you that you have joined us together, uh, that the most important thing is that uh, we all belong to you, that we are adopted children of you, uh, and that is so more important than anything else that may potentially divide us. I pray that you would keep us unified, keep the church um, serving you, glorifying you, and may we look to do this better each day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so thanks uh, for being here. As I said, uh, we're now in the third week. It's when fatigue starts to set in, but hopefully not too soon. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion of sin. I know not everybody's uh, upbeat movement, but there's a reason for this, and it will actually, I think, help us see things anew. Well, at least that's the hope. Uh, and I'm going to start by just uh, referencing Romans 7. I'm not going to go through the entire passage, but in particular... The, the portion between verses 7 and 25, uh, where Paul talks about this great struggle, and the struggles between the flesh and the mind, the law and sin. And so I, I, I'm just going to start with that. I'm going to assume that we're familiar with this passage. We probably are in one way or another. You know, the conflict where he says, the things that I don't want to do, I actually find myself doing. Uh, we've, we, and then this comes right before the great deliverance of Pauline passages, Romans 8. Right, so it's, it's like the perfect sort of precursor to what occurs in the chapter that occurs next, um, realizing there weren't chapter divisions originally when this was composed, right, when the scriptures were written, but they were added later. Uh, but one of the ideas here in this passage, I'm going to use this as my point of departure today. In this passage, Paul talks about the struggle, uh, the struggle between the mind and the flesh, the warring parties, uh, the law and sin. He even makes claims that I didn't really know what covetousness was until the law told me what it was, and then sin seemed to abound as a result, right? So it can almost come off like he's blaming the law for the depth of the sin, but no, this, the, the law actually exposes this, uh, makes us reve reveal to ourselves that we are incapable of saving ourselves. In fact, the law points to someone else to fulfill that law, and it's critically important that we don't lose sight of that. And I want to just reference that in what we're going to continue our discussion about sin. But Paul is pretty quick to point out that sin is constantly looking, and I'll quote, to seize an opportunity. In fact, he uses that twice in a series of verses. Uh, that it's almost like masquerading, looking for the opportunity, looking for a desirable time to come in uh, to make itself more appealing and more alluring to us. Uh, and so that's the, the key part here about sin. So we know that the believer's response to sin ought to be one of repentance. In fact, it goes beyond just repenting. It's repenting about our weak repentance, right? Realizing that even in our repentance, it's marked by sin. So Paul pointing out this sort of distinction is, is making something clear uh, that when it concerns the subject of sin and evil, right, it's looking for an opportunity. It masquerades itself as light. It often appeals to that sort of God-given appetite that we have for good. Right? Some, someone might say, I, I just, you know, it promises maybe shortcuts or something along that line, that, you know, that as long as the, the ends are okay, does the means really matter? That kind of a, a idea. So when I'm, when I'm sort of thinking about this in, in this line, uh, it's, it's uh, I couldn't help myself. I don't remember if you remember, and since TJ just talked about the yellow pages, I don't know if you remember the commercial for Canon, you know, when they used to sell cameras. So I'm going along the yellow page line when people used to buy cameras. Uh, Andre Agassi had that commercial with Canon, image is everything. Do you remember that? Image is everything? Yeah. Uh, well, well, that's the kind of idea here, right? Since image is everything, what I project, and I'm going to start to make a lot, a lot with that. But the reality here is, the truth is, uh, most people, most evil people, uh, people that sort of double down on evil, are desperately trying to resist any awareness of that. No one really wants to think of themselves as evil. Right? So uh, there almost becomes a sort of conflict within themselves. In fact, self-deception is something that starts to enter in. We're going to talk a lot about that today, hopefully. That nobody sees themselves as evil. So I want to resist any awareness that I'm evil. It's very rare that people will double down on evil. In fact, Megan and I on the ride home last week, she reminded me about Edward Brock Jr., I don't know if anybody knows who Edward Brock Jr. was, but you may know him by another name, Venom. No, you still don't know him, but uh, in Spider-Man 3, Edward Brock Jr., 
sometimes goes by Eddie Brock Jr., uh, has a lot of problems, a lot of things going wrong, but he seems ambitious. He wants to, you know, he wants to be the guy. Peter Parker's in the way, and he starts to become really angry. Eventually, he gets seduced, if you will, by Venom. He kind of resists it in, at first, only to embrace it, and then only to wind up dying for it. And that's a good reminder that sin always demands death. It always leads to death. It may promise life, but the delivery is death. Never changes. Um, but there's a line where Eddie says, and I wrote this down because I wanted to get it right. Uh, I like being mad. It makes me happy. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Uh, I like being mad. Now, this is like the villain in the cartoons that twirls the mustache and, you know, reveals or does that evil laugh. Like the Muppets movie, a maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh. <laughs> Right, it's, it's that kind of, it doesn't happen that way, and uh, with all due respect to Eddie Brock Jr., most of the evil that we see, it's not in your face like that. It's far more subtle, far more nuanced, and the people themselves don't see themselves as evil. And that's what's fascinating to me, at least. So uh, it, it looks like, uh, I don't, I, I, there's one treatment, um, Robert Lifton wrote this book, uh, concerning the, the, the medicalized killing under the Nazi program, the Nazi doctors, fascinating book. In it, he talks about psychic doubling, this idea that people can actually compartmentalize belief, believe they're doing one thing, but they're actually doing another. Um, and you can think of it in other terms like revisionism. Uh, that someone might rewrite their story, and we tend to do that, right? So if you have a relationship, imagine a, 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 you know, someone goes to see Megan for marriage therapy, and I'm not saying she, we didn't do this, so, but imagine someone goes for marriage therapy and says, uh, you know, I, I was convinced that he was funny, uh, but he lied to me, right? So they start sort of revising their past so that they're never in the wrong. Like, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, you must have deceived me somehow, or I thought you were charming, and I learned later that was just a ruse, that kind of idea. So revisionism, doubling, not really realizing that's the kind of stuff that we see people often doing. Um, and what I want to say is now, that's not usually what we'll do in the church. Uh, what we often do, uh, or at least can be prone to do, is use religion to help construct God in our own image, better versions of ourselves, ones in which we see it as a God is more perfect than we are. Like, um, we don't always see the gap between us and God. You think it's not as big as it may be. So I think someone might fall prey to that kind of prone or, or tendency that uh, God becomes more like us but only greater perfections. Um, and this is true potentially inside and outside the church. So uh, it's not as the case that he's someone else, that he's the triune God revealed by scriptures, right? um, tradition and in revelation. It's more just we construct him. He's not really revealed to us. And I think of this in terms of the objections that often people do with the problem of evil. So uh, as someone who's thought a lot about that, but not nearly enough, because what's the biggest criticism people tend to have? Uh, the problem of evil. That's, that's probably the biggest one where you can understand other problems of evil like divine hiddenness, which is in essence a form of a problem of evil. Uh, I can deal with the suffering, but why does it seem that God is absent in the suffering? So that's a divine hiddenness argument. So basically, anyone who's considered this or thought about this, and uh, the objections almost always start this way. If I were God, I would not do X. X occurs, so God must not really be there or care or indifferent or aloof or some, some kind of problem. All right, so, uh, and what that reveals to us is the defect is always supposedly in God and not really in us. It's very rare that someone says, Maybe our understanding of what the divine would do itself is really warped and uh, disfigured, and, and, and we're not really good detectors at this. It's almost like someone trying to identify counterfeit money by only looking at counterfeit money. The way you get better at understanding counterfeit is by becoming really good at studying the real thing. So the more you know the authentic thing itself, the more likely you are to spot defects and flaws. Uh, I saw this with Airbnbs, and I know in Hollywood, I'm sure this is true elsewhere, 
more and more people are buying up properties and turning them to Airbnbs. And I'm not criticizing you if you have an Airbnb, although really I kind of am judging you because I'm very judgy and I wish I wasn't that way. Uh, but they throw a lot of parties. Our next door house is one and it fits 10 people and it's, it's, it can be a problem. All right, so uh, I saw an article about Airbnbs in terms of people uh, replacing smoke detectors and putting hidden cameras because cameras are far more small than they've ever been before. And they're putting them in places you wouldn't expect a smoke detector. So the study, that, this study, I don't know how, uh, how credible it is. I mean, it's like any study, but it said that as much as one in 10 Airbnb properties probably have hidden detecting cameras in them. Uh, so maybe that will make you not want to use Airbnb and that'll make me feel better because they'll go unrented. But, uh, see, double dealing and serving my own interest. Uh, but one of the things the article pointed out that I thought was quite clever was learn what a real smoke detector looks like, and then you'll be able to spot the deficiency. And I thought, how brilliant is that? It's just a further illustration that the counterfeit and the real thing, the more you know the real thing, the more you are in tune to the fact of something being counterfeited. Right? And so... Uh, the righteousness that comes from using religion is in essence a counterfeit righteousness. And David Zoll calls this high anthropology. And so I'm going to borrow the term from him. I'm going to use it a little bit differently than he uses it. Uh, not because I don't think it's great the way he uses it. I just have a different purpose for how I want to use it. And I'm not saying they're that much different. If you're interested in reading his book, it's called Low Anthropology. Uh, but the idea basically is, for me, my understanding of higher anthropology is any attempt at righteousness that glorifies man and lowers God. All right, so the, the seek is a sort of glorify ourselves, think of ourselves potentially as better or capable of becoming better and not necessarily relying completely and solely on the grace of God. All right, so that's, that's my sort of summary of it and, and take of it. And, and so there's at least two ways that I want to talk about that this counterfeit righteousness can present itself. Uh, and one way is a bumper sticker I saw in I-95. I know TJ loves bumper stickers. I don't know if you ever saw this one. Uh, and I, again, I, I risk saying this because maybe you have it, but uh, it said, I was on I-95 and I'm always at like an eight in terms of the 10 anger scale, as I mentioned. So the audio books helped me go to about a two. Uh, and I, I saw this car in front of me and uh, the bumper sticker said, Jesus was a liberal. And so I thought, I actually wrote that bumper sticker. did you get, <laughs> I'm so glad. Uh, it's part of the compensation package. At least he's, you know. Uh, and just for the record, uh, Jesus was neither liberal nor conservative in terms of the divisions that we typically make. Uh, let's not limit him in that way, and that's part of the point. Uh, but I saw that Jesus was a liberal, and it reminded me of this idea of, well, what does the person probably mean? Now, of course, we're on 95, so I'm not going to speed up, roll down my window, and yell at him. So can you tell me what you mean by that? I, I think I'm taking some liberties here, but I don't think this is too gratuitous in, ta in liberty taking. He probably thinks Jesus is very affirming, very loving, very respectful of differences, a celebrator of these differences, and all these things are true. Uh, but I think he'd probably be less reluctant to say, you know, it's like that ad, he gets us. Right? So Jesus gets us. He's like us, just a little what? A little better. Um, so it's not necessarily the idea. Did I lose people in the room? <laughs> study what you look at, <laughs> there's a lot of flaws with that. So, he, you know, that kind of approach, and uh, not he's condemning, judging, wrathful. We once had a sermon preached uh, about God as being jealous by Gordon. I had never heard a sermon on jealousy with God. Right? And maybe you're like, well, maybe there's a good reason for that. People are like, I can't think of God as being jealous, because we think of jealousy in a way that God is not. But We'll talk about jealousy and envy, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, all right? So, uh, but what I'm saying here is there's a way in which we want to elevate certain characteristics of God because it's more in tune with what we think we would be if we were God, all right? Not very judging. I'm not going to condemn people to hell just because they don't believe kind of idea. What kind of loving parent would do that? Isn't that how the argument usually goes? 
you as a loving parent would never behave that way, so why would a God behave that way? Uh, that's one way we can get wrong uh, and this sort of counterfeit righteousness. Another way is probably the one that we're more familiar with inside the church, the hypocritical version, where we start seeing ourselves as potentially better than the other. And I'm benefited by TJ and the recommendations he's made for books over the years. And uh, this one is from Flannery O'Connor, a short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find. So I, I was just thinking about this as an example of counterfeit righteousness. Plus, the short story starts with a line that I think many of us may have felt. The grandmother did not want to go to Florida. So, <laughs> you know, how many people always want to move to South Florida? I, I did, okay, but, you know. So I knew it had me just from the very first line. I'm like, wow, sweet. So the grandmother did not want to come to Florida. I'm just going to capture the story very quickly. I don't want to belabor. I just want to point the highlight here about this counterfeit righteousness. And I'm not going to assume any familiarity with the story, but if you're interested in reading a short story, uh, it might be six to eight pages. It's well worth well worth looking into. Uh, but the, this grandmother is the quintessential hypocritical self-righteous woman. She's convinced that she has status when no one else has status, even though sort of comically she doesn't have any status at all. Right? So, uh, but she keeps up appearances of status. It's almost like imagine someone who's extremely wealthy loses that wealth but still maintains that appearance of wealth. Because we know one thing, we have to keep up appearances. And so in her mind, she comes from good blood, good stock. She's got the right stuff. And then very few people, especially people that are not from good blood, however that's defined, and it's not defined very well, are not like her. That's the one thing she seems to be convinced of. She judges everyone and everything, including her own family. Right? Uh, and the comical cracks in her character start to emerge as they go on this journey to Florida when she really wants to go to Tennessee. And again, I can resonate with that because I love the mountains in Tennessee, so maybe I am the grandmother and I, yeah. Uh, she becomes resolute that she's the arbiter of truth, beauty, and goodness. Right? And only she's the one that's going to know that. But in the course of this trip, an accident happens. Mostly because she tries to convince them. I mean, it's an example I talked about last week, how we don't always know the effects of our actions, right? In fact, Paul says that I don't understand my own actions in the passages I referenced. So she doesn't see that what's about to happen because she tried to take this detour. But they wind up having the car flip over. And at the same time, there's a couple of people that have escaped prison, and one goes by the name the Misfit, right? Uh, and she has the unfortunate reality of running into this misfit and she's convinced about again good blood she takes this misfit to be someone of good blood so already unlike the others uh which is interesting enough uh and one of the things that i remember when i read it was that uh he had white teeth and i just i love that because americans are obsessed with white teeth i mean I, i'm meg and i are watching this show shetland it takes place in scotland fantastic show uh, well, I think it is, but whatever. It doesn't mean you have to. <laughs> but Detective Sergeant McIntosh, who goes by Tosh, in the first episode has braces, and everyone's like, why do you have braces? And they don't. She says, because I don't want Scottish teeth. I want American teeth. So, <laughs> so we must have a reputation in this country about white teeth. Right? So uh, I'm just going to go with that for now. Uh, so, so this guy, even though he's shirtless and seems a little strange, has white teeth, so he must not be of totally bad blood. All right, so uh, in the end, the misfit finally comes upon them with his two friends, uh, and I use friends loosely because evil people, what kind of friends do they actually make? That's a whole other discussion that one can have. Uh, but she eventually finds herself with a gun to her head, All right, and... Uh, She's sort of in a dilemma here. I thought you were good blood, and I'm convinced you are. And then she starts bargaining with him, pleading with him. It's at this moment where she realizes that she cannot save herself. It's at this moment where that high anthropology view that she had, that I am someone of importance, comes crashing down with reality. It's when the karmic view gives way to something else. That I, I, and, and it's comical, because at one point she says, I will pay you money. And it doesn't seem like we have any evidence that money is something that she has a great possession of. I, you know, I, I'm going to take care of you. I can do this for you. 
and he uh, kind of keeps engaging, and then eventually, after she realizes the error of her ways and the fact that she is completely at the mercy of this man and realizes that her own self-salvation project is not going to be effective for her, in that moment, she realizes and says something bizarre. She calls him one of my babies and reaches to touch this guy. And Flannery O'Connor says, after getting touched on the shoulder, the man, this misfit, just jerks back like he was bitten by a snake. And then he shoots her three times in the chest. Right. And uh, I like this idea of touching because she's touching him in a way that he's never been touched before. Sort of a low anthropology movement. Grace, compassion, reaching out to this man. Almost like, why are you doing this kind of idea? No more like, I thought you were like me, one of the good people. More like, I now know you're like me, one of the bad people. But let me reach out to you with compassion and grace and mercy. And he's not used to that, so he recoils and reacts in the only way that he knows how. And then he also realizes that, so the touch is far into the misfit, but it's also far into her. And that's why the misfit says, and this is the quote that everybody knows who's read the story because it's fantastic, and I want to read it verbatim here. She would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. <laughs> so, uh, basically, if we don't face crisis, we can delude ourselves into thinking that we're enough. That, that you know, I can fall back on my success, on my record. And, and so, when does the record fail? When, when you do lose all the things that you put in. Uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you have status, and suddenly you no longer have status. Or when you transition from working to no longer working, and someone's identity was working. Or if you have a relationship that falls apart or children leave. And, and, you know, so we go through elements like this throughout our life. But the point here is, if she would have come to the drips that she is not enough, that her bloodlines are not going to be sufficient to save her, aside from the fact that she had no evidence that she was of high noble birth to begin with. There's a whole story about her hat and getting destroyed in the ground. Like, you know, it just shows the appearances get destroyed. But... Uh, what I want to point out here is, and I'm going to sort of get this collision that I'm trying to get to. The truth is we, we often settle for this counterfeit righteousness. And this counterfeit righteousness is marked by self-deception. And I'm going to talk about that uh, right now. Uh, and we not only deceive ourselves initially, but then we sort of convince ourselves that we're not deceiving ourselves. It's like this fascinating aspect of deception that works this way where... We know the ordinary ways of, of sort of self-deception, getting yourself to believe something different than what is, like the, the use of euphemisms. It's a slowdown, a correction in the market. Uh, there was a comedian once that, and I'm not recommending him, and I'm not going to say his name, but there was a comedian once that had a whole joke about euphemisms and things on planes where they would say, you know, you know when they did the spiel, and, and I'm about to go on one, Lord willing, in a few days, so they'll often say stuff like, if there's a sudden change in cabin pressure. So he came in and said, roof flies off. <laughs> you know, so, so and, you know, his whole point is, we, we say these things, but what we really mean is, roof flies off. And if the roof flies off, you're not going to be calmly looking for the mask. Right? Uh, and then he continues, but I, I won't go there. But, you know, one more. He says, you know, uh, please get in get in the plane. He's like, well, I'm not going to get on the plane. I'm going to leave that to evil Knievel, right? So basically the idea is we use these euphemisms. Sometimes it's just a way of conversing, but what, what we're saying here is there are many times where we know something's true, but we get ourselves to believe something else. And then over time, the belief is all we really focus on, and we forget that which we thought we originally knew. It sort of loses its clarity. It loses its sense of strength, right? And so, imagine recalling Paul from this passage from Romans 7, where he, Romans 7, where he says, we don't understand our own actions, right? I don't really know why I do what I do. All I know is I do the things that I don't want to do. And who's going to deliver me from this body of death? You know, the, this, this, this sin that just seems to just be part of my members. 
And it's not God who's in the dock on this because the law is good, God is good. And we see the deliverance passage again in the very next chapter, which I mentioned earlier. But there's some essence here that can get drawn out. We know that we are not our own saviors. We are not sufficient in saving ourselves. We are not enough. And yet we come to believe that, we, that if we only exercise enough discipline, if we only beat ourselves into it, get with the right people, have only people that will tell us the things that will encourage us, then we can become enough. And that's the sort of problem uh, where we start to think, I know that I'm not enough and I need a savior. But then we slowly over time run the risk of thinking, well, I can become better if I just set myself to this task. And the latter belief makes use of religion uh, and not in the objective truth of the gospel. The good news that you are not enough, I'm not enough, there's nothing I can do to become enough. In fact, it's in our weakness that we cry out and realize I am not able to take myself out of this position. And it's not the kind of deliverance that someone might have in a war zone where they just say, you know, I, just see me through this. I'll do whatever you want. I mean, that, that again is that karmic interpretation. That's the grandmother. I'll give you everything I have if you just don't shoot me. All right? uh, it's not that. It's the idea that I become convinced that the way of salvation is also the way of growth in the Christian life. That we're saved by grace through faith and we're sanctified the same exact way. It's not like we, there's two separate manuals, that there's one that gets you into the kingdom and then one you start to learn once you're into the secret powers. I mean, sometimes religions have that in there, right? Or things that function as religions, or at least the state recognizes that as religions. Um, and, and yet, that's not what, what we're about here. So all attempts at doing something like that is one, a failure to understand the depths of our depravity and even the, the, the lack of good motives. And if I ask a lot of people, they might think, well, I'm a good person, I have mostly good motives. Um, I, I think of the Walter White example out of Breaking Bad, and if you haven't seen the show, it's okay. If you haven't, I'm not recommending it. But what I will say is, I'm not either recommending or not recommending it. You do, you do that. But, and I'm gonna ruin it if you haven't seen it, but it's been around so long that, you know, what can you do? But Walter White throughout the series is convinced that everything he does, he's doing for his family. The way someone may be convinced when they're doing evil doing, that they're really taking care of their family. There was a famous rapper that once had a line, I know it's wrong to sell crack to the kids, but I gotta get paid. That's the way it is. I know it's wrong to do this, but what? It's also wrong to not take care of your family. It's also wrong to not reward your friends and give them jobs. And, hook them up at barbecues every day, right? So we have this sort of tension, right? Uh, and Walter White convinces himself that this is all for his family. At the very end, the very last episode, the whole reason the show exists, my word, is that he's sitting with his ex-wife now and he's about to say something she's heard time and time again, that he did this for the family. And she says, if I have to hear this one more time, I'm gonna get sick. And he, said, and he says something that truly flaws her. He's like, no, 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 I'm not gonna say that because that's just not true. I did it for me. I did it because I was good at it. Because I finally had status. I'm finally enough. I was great. I designed this company. I sold it for like $10,000. How dare I? I'm smarter than everybody. I'm teaching chemistry to underperforming, underachieving students that give me a test and I can appreciate this. And it says 59, hey, can I have one more point? Do you know how many times I get people bargaining for grades? <laughs> to which I wanna say, keeping with the sin theory, I have a PayPal account for that. <laughs> We're really gonna do <laughs> No, I don't ever do that. <laughs> I don't ever do that. But, the, the, <laughs> okay, the point of the matter is, he feels like a loser. And this criminal enterprise, where he just goes from sitting on a toilet trying to figure out the rightness or wrongness of killing a local drug dealer, 
to becoming international in Checha. How does that happen? Because he's great. He's enough. But when he eventually dies, he dies alone, surrounded by drug meth chambers, with no one there around him. Now, it looks like he's at peace, right? They almost present it like that. There's no peace there. All there is is counterfeit righteousness. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. All of us are either going to stand on record of our own counterfeit righteousness, and we know what that leads to, death and judgment, or the righteousness of Christ. And that one leads to life. So next week, we're going to look at the folly of sin. Because we can look at these characters and think, how silly is this that people, like this grandmother, like isn't this a stupid character? Doesn't she realize? I am really good at spotting hypocrites. I'm not exceptionally good at spotting the hypocrite inside. I sometimes like to listen to Whitney Houston because Whitney Houston can sing really well. I'm sure, well, she could. I'm sure you probably remember the game that every New Yorker remembers, because even if they leave New York, they still love New York teams. Not judging you, I kind of am, but, you know, but it's okay. We're having fun at this moment here. But the giants Bills Super Bowl, where Whitney Houston sang the national anthem, it's well understood to be one of the best versions that was ever rendered. And, she ha and if you have never heard it, that's what Google, that's a good thing for the internet. You can go find it. It really is exceptional. She also sang the greatest love of all. And her answer was, you know what the greatest love of all is? Myself. Wow, you lost me there. <laughs> so that's the kind of idea. If you think the greatest love of all is yourself, you will stand with that record. And that record will become wanting. You and I know better. We know that that record where we polish ourselves, it's not really going to stand the weight we can't bear up under the glory that can only be ascribed to God. And it's best we understand that limitation. So in light of that, when we look at the folly of sin, it's very comical to look at the many ways people try to make themselves be enough. Look at how much I've done. Look at all the good things I've done. So Lord willing, next week we'll look at the many ways of the folly of sin. Uh, we have a few minutes. If you have questions, if not, then that can be good too. Yes, Megan. Yeah, and I'm just going to appeal to TJ's example about how lungs receive oxygen, right? So uh, you don't do anything to breathe. You can't do that. I'm just going to breathe better. Let me work on breathing. I mean, you can use breathing techniques to slow down anxiety. We all know that that's a good technique, right, to control the moment, if you will. Uh, but, but you don't control the oxygen in the air and you just receive it. In the same way, we receive grace, which enables us to effectively live out that. But it's not our own doing. Um, I'll give an example, an analogy with weight loss. We all know that Americans can lose weight. We can do that. We just can't always keep it off, right? So they have done studies with like the biggest loser contestants. Within a year, all of them put that weight back on and actually gain more than they lost because the process that it comes off, they starve them to death, they exercise them like crazy. That's not really making good effectual life changes where they're actually learning calorie restriction, you know, the idea of portion control, whatever it might be, right? Making it a lifestyle choice. The, so I'm not against lifestyle choices, for instance, reading the Bible, praying, that's great. But none of those things are going to make you right with God. Right? None of those things, and you can run out of steam when it's your own discipline. I mean, I, I know I've gone through phases like that. I'm going to do this more. I'm going to double down with this prospect, um, only to realize that eventually that self-discipline, that initial draw runs out of steam. It's what Francis Schaeffer says, we work hard to rest. Uh, and that, that, that's the idea, that I, I need to be active about passively receiving rather than trying to work God in some sort of karmic way that if I pray more, 
He'll bless me more. And that's a, that's a bumper sticker TJ's mentioned before that I love. Uh, the, the, as the prayers go up, the blessings come down, right? That, that, that as we please God, we're going to get the benefit. That's not how God works. All right? So that's the kind of idea that, that, that I would say about um, the, the process of growing. It's, you know what it is? It's almost like you're not conscious of growing. You're just growing. The grass grows, but you don't see it. So if you ever watch grass growing or flowers, they speed it up on YouTube or whatever because it's a long process. It, it's not consciously aware that it's growing. So my thought is we grow in ways that we're not always perceptibly aware of, but other people can see it. So they start seeing the fruit of that tree. And what we said a couple weeks ago is evil trees bear evil fruit. And so in some way we know that and see it that way. Uh, but being self-conscious about our development is one sign that's really not a good thing. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but yeah. All right, and this will be the last one because I want to set you down, sir. Could you expand uh, counterfeit righteousness? Yeah, so the way I'm using the term, and I'm not saying it's the only way of using it, it's the idea where, or self-righteousness, where someone presents on the outside as if they have things figured out, but inwardly uh, they're relying on their own power, their own sort of steam to engine the, the, the vessel, right? So... And the way that a lot of people, and again, it can look different. That's why I tried to use those two different scenarios. One way people can do this is by um, status and what they receive. And the other way is just being convinced that God is kind of like them, but only better. Right? That, and that was that if I were God, I would do X. You know, that doesn't happen. So um, how do we know what counterfeit righteousness looks like? By studying the true righteousness of Christ. That's the idea of how do you recognize counterfeit money? By studying genuine money. Because if it's just charisma, if it's just the ability to move a crowd, every cult leader has that. Right? Uh, so that's not how you discern it. But when you see people you know, speaking and there's no understanding of what Christ has done, then, then you know that that's one essence of counterfeit. So when Paul says this, what does he remind us of? That, that every opportunity there is... You know, seizing the opportunity, evil seizes the opportunity, masquerading as light. We need to be good detectors of that. Uh, not in the sense that, again, we, we work this out, but allowing God to reveal to us through the scriptures, through tradition, through general revelation, through each other, right? That's why I need people in my life, because uh, I would have made really bad decisions. I've made a lot of bad decisions. Thankfully, coming to Florida was not one of them. Although at the time... <laughs> But, but one of the thoughts we can do is we can have each other to help each other. Like, you know, hey, let me, you know, Job's friends were great until they opened their mouth. And seriously, they, they sat with him. But when they started telling him, man, I think you're cursed. You must have done something wrong because they themselves thought God as a sort of karmic idea. That, you know, if you're this bad, you must have done some hidden sin of which we're unaware of. Um, so that's my idea of, of recognizing the counter. Study the right fruit helps you detect the bad fruit. I will leave time in the coming weeks for more questions and discussions, so hopefully that you, I want you to have an opportunity to do that. Myself, too, I need to think and learn more about this. But um, we're at time now, so I'm going to pray for us. Thanks for being here. Uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll reconvene next week and look at sin as folly. And I realize there's the camping trip going on, so um, you don't have to fight for spots, which is good. All right. Father, we thank you again for the time that you've given to us. Uh, we pray that you would just continue to make the gospel more clear to us. I uh, pray that we would preach this gospel to ourselves every day because we are in need of the gospel today just as we were when we first believed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.